Hello, my name is Alan Johnson. I'm passionate about the arts, both visual and performance, which is why I decided to create this special tribute entitled, The Making of an Artist. Artists will endure almost anything for their professions. Writers will brave months of dreaming and researching and plotting and rewriting and rewriting again. Painters will paint all day and late into the night, often on huge, expensive canvases. Dancers will practice for years, torturing their feet and stretching beyond incomprehensible limits. Musicians will sit at the piano for hours every day, practicing one scale after the other, even when they would rather be hanging out with their friends. Metal sculptors will work through the heat and ice to create gargantuan works of art whose heights are only surpassed by their expenses. Actors will audition, rehearse, memorize thousands of lines, and study the craft of acting throughout their entire careers. Photographers will study the art and technology of creating powerful images and do it all in very expensive studios. Being an artist is demanding, no question. So what is it that draws people to the arts? What are their missions? What brings them joy? What challenges them? And what are their recommendations to young artists? These are the questions that we posed to seven professional artists. I think your art finds you. There's a great story about a woman who is working in the field and she's working away and all of a sudden she gets a line for a poem and she knows she has to run home before the poem leaves her and write it down because if she keeps working the poem will pass her by and go to somebody else who is open and ready to explore it and I'm not sure it works exa exactly that way but I do think um, at least for me I knew that I wanted to write from a very young age. It found me. Now, what I do with that is up to me, and I can express it in lots of different ways. Poetry, fiction, um, essays, plays. But I knew that writing had sought me out, and it was something that I was supposed to do. My belief, based on my experience, is that um, I was born an artist. Um, I'm completely spoiled by the feeling of making marks on things and I've never wanted to do anything else. That's what I've filled my free time with and, and my parents tell me that that's how they kept me quiet as a child was to give me pen and paper and um, so I've always wanted to be an artist and, and I've thought at times how can, I, how can I parlay this into a career, but really all I want to do is paint. My art's always been a way into my inner world, and as a child I would, um, I would draw out scenarios and people, and, and then I would play with them in my head. So I could stare at a drawing I'd done of a different characters or families. Uh, I had a group of kids in my head that I made stories with and I, and I would draw them and they, they were like this ragtag, ragamuffin group and they all wore pots and pans on their head. And so I would draw these kids and imagine their adventures and it, it filled hours of my time. I think it's the art that I love. I love uh, the telling of a story the becoming a part of the story, um, bringing people with you along in that story, um, having the same feeling 
that you have and being able to communicate it to other people so that they can have that same feeling, um, it, have different experiences than my life experiences had ever been. Uh, you know, reaching into that um, different point of view and having other people that light come on and see that other point of view in acting. I think the applause is the applause factor is fantastic. It doesn't always happen. You know, applause is great um, in comedies. The laughter is immediate gratification. That's wonderful for those of us that have egos that need to be fed like that. But uh, um, serious moments, the tangible moments, those moments where your, your character is hurt or feels betrayed or is wounded or is carrying a burden that seems beyond them, those are the moments you, you don't get applause. Being in that moment and making it real, making it feel real, and so you know you don't get the applause, but you know the audience is with you. Uh, there's just there's nothing like that kind of feeling. <laughs> My mom and dad were also musicians. They played every Friday and Saturday night at the Pasco Eagles Club. And my dad would wake me up in the middle of the night. He'd come into my room and he'd say, Debbie, you got to get up and play for all the people here. Well, the first time I did it, my mom was completely annoyed because I should have been sleeping. It was about 2 in the morning and dad had had a, maybe a couple too many drinks. But he was so proud of me and he wanted to show me off to his friends. So I got up and I played whatever piano song I was working on. And they loved me. And that felt so good to me, even way back then when I was about seven or eight years old. And these people were ancient. They were like 50 or 60. <laughs> I'm 62 now, so I don't feel like that's ancient. But in any case, back then when I was seven, they were ancient. And we didn't feel any age difference. And I look back on that and those memories of getting pulled out of bed to play a piece as being very important in my quest for being a musician. So there's three reasons why I'm an artist. Truth, expression, and freedom. So art is one of the best mediums to explain the deeper truths of life. Deeper truths such as emotion, belonging, interconnectedness. These are very abstract notions that uh, are best understood through uh, creative, artful endeavors. The other reason is uh, expression, and um, art allows me to express the deepest parts of my soul and to basically allow my vessel of consciousness to be empty. I have no stagnation uh, because I can release everything that's on the inside through my art. And the other reason is because of freedom. Uh, art, the art world, unlike any other paths, uh, is one of the most accepting um, careers for eccentric people and it's for that reason. I can dress however I want, I can go for a hike whenever I want, I can say whatever I want, and uh, I have an incredible amount of freedom. So the reason why I'm a sculptor is because sculpture, uh, due to its nature, uh, three-dimensional nature, it uh, creates space and it creates gravity and that gravity is um, um, unignorable. I like to do uh, large-scale public sculptures, and this, these sculptures are visible not just to hundreds, but to millions of people, and for that reason it has um, a, greater, a greater influence and a more positive effect, and I believe it increases the quality of life uh, of the surrounding environment and community. So that's why I do large-scale sculptures. So, uh, I am a dancer. I, I, I grew up dancing. I started ballet classes when I was six years old in Yakima, Washington, and I did not expect to fall in love with dance as an art form. I did it because I loved being in the studio and I loved performing on stage and I loved hearing the music and being able to um, have this expressive time with it in this kind of controlled environment. Um, as a child, I was very, very shy. And I, I grew up with a lot of anxiety about talking with other people and um, engaging with people both at school and at social events. And for whatever reason, 
Dance allowed me this sort of magical, uh, safe place where I could just be myself and it was comfortable. Uh, being in front of the classroom was scary and going to the grocery counter and asking the clerk uh, for something was scary, but being in a dance class and even being on stage, as strange as that may seem, um, it wasn't scary, it was exhilarating and it was exciting and it was addictive. And so it was something that I continued to pursue throughout middle school and high school. And eventually um, I continued to pursue dance as a profession. And by the time I was about 18 years old, I was uh, hired by a professional dance company and I continued a professional career for about 12 years. Um, and through all of that time, I actually had many many ups and downs. It wasn't always exciting and it wasn't always fun as a job, but I continued to come back to it as my passion and as the thing that I was always striving for um, because of this, this fulfillment that dance gave me and this confidence that it gave that, that scared, nervous, shy little girl to be a, a person, I could be a different person as a dancer, I could be a different person on stage. And over time, that allowed me to develop into um, other things like a dance teacher, an administrator, and even into other jobs with a, a lot of confidence that maybe I would not have gotten in any other um, environment. So the question is, why am I an artist? Well, first of all, you have to know, I didn't have much of a choice in life. My mother was an artist and I would come home from school or even late at night, I would get up in the middle of the night and I would see my mom working in her studio, painting away, do, sculpting, doing other kind of crazy things that, that artists do and, um, and inventing things. And that's just the home I was raised in. I remember as a kid doing everything from macrame projects to um, putting popsicle sticks together and painting them and trying to develop things. And it just was something we always did. Went to school to, to be a professional musician. and. When I, I got into school and I really realized that music wasn't my art, it was then a matter of what kind of art I was going to do. And I tried to be a lot of other things as well in my life, but I, I found that photography was my hobby. It started out as a camera collection that just kind of went crazy. I would have my camera and I'd, I'd be messing around with it. I'd be adjusting all these different things. And it became, over time, less and less about my cameras and more and more about the images that I took. And with that, it turned into my true passion and my true love and something I really wanted to do for the rest of my life. Stories are so important. Um, they're how we understand the world and how we make sense of what's going on in the world. And so I think that writing and Fiction are incredibly important because narrative is how we measure our lives. For me in particular, I like to think that my stories are a call to wonder. And that's really important to me because I think that we've forgotten wonder in the busyness and the clamor of life. And so I think about that and the kinds of stories I write um, that often have some kind of a magical or mythic element to them that they are a call to explore wonder. And the other thing is to see the world through someone else's point of view. And that's so important in our culture today. We've forgotten how to do that. We've become so locked into our own point of view. So those are, uh, for stories and poems, uh, that's my mission, to remind people of wonder, to explore empathy in other people's points of view. The mission of my craft is to give back everything that the universe has given to me. Um, in Native American culture, uh, the, the buffalo was considered a very sacred animal, and, and part of that is because when the buffalo was killed, every single part of it was used. And, and for me, 
painting is a sort of bloodletting. It's the way that I acknowledge and, and say thank you to the universe for everything that I've experienced. Um, in my signature, I use uh, the buffalo. Uh, this is Buffalo Girl, and she's bowing down in thanks to the universe, and this is how she says thank you for everything that she's seen in her life. I think the mission of acting, the mission of the goal, is to uh, experience something other than your life experience. You walk into a room, you sit down at a theater, and you join on a journey that the story is and that the actors take you through. And if it's believable, um, you see a little bit of part of something that you can relate to, and then you go on that journey with them. And by the end, you should have felt like you've been somewhere. You should have felt like I've been, experienced something that I never would have experienced on my own. I've lived another life maybe. I've, I've, I've been uh, touched by feelings that I hadn't before. And now I see something a little bit differently. I've experienced something a little bit differently. Um, I, think that's, I think that's the goal for any good actor. My mission behind music would depend upon what hat I have on at the moment. When I'm a teacher, I have on my teacher hat and I'm trying to teach the kids to practice excellence and to make it their very best attempt every day, not just on the stage, but every day in class. So I had a very big mission every day in my classrooms. And I carry that over into my professional life as well. I think it's so important that we give our level best every time, and that's my mission, is to every time I perform, whether it's in practice or in front of people, that it's my absolute best. I need to honor music that way. That's my mission. My purpose in life is to improve the world. And I believe one way that we can improve the world is to uh, provide space and reason uh, for people to slow down and um, introspect and to look around them uh, and to inspire curiosity. And I believe that art and, and sculpture allows, um, allows for that inspiration and that slowing down. It's my intent to derail people from their tracks of normalcy, even if momentarily, to break people away from uh, the concrete world and, and boxes and uh, the virtual world and um, uh, give people an excuse to just be alive. So the mission of dance as an art form is a tricky question because uh, there's actually two different um, intentions that uh, people need to follow as dancers. So as a dancer, your, your goal is to complete the vision of the choreographer. And the way that we do that as dancers is we train very hard every day in class. Usually that's a, a ballet class for concert dancers, but for other dancers, maybe in a folk dance field or um, a, a field like break dancing or something that has a little bit more competitive uh, edge, there, it, there's other types of training. Um, but our, our goal as dancers is to be able to, at the drop of a hat, do whatever the choreographer asks us to do. As choreographers, our goal is to really create work that an audience member can connect to. Maybe they can connect to the story, maybe they can connect to the visuals, maybe they can connect to some sort of political or historical statement inside the works. An overarching mission for dance is to connect people to ideas in a way that sometimes words cannot. I leave a legacy. People will look at those images for centuries, for generations, they'll be looking at those images. I know that I have images from the 1800s from the late 1870s and 1890s and that are past members of my family, early 1900s that are my wife's uh, family, that we look at those, those images and, and you sit there in awe and think, wow, that was someone's great uncle, great aunt, great grandmother, and, um, or my great grandmother in, in, in my case. And to know that that person was on this earth and was loved and they wanted to be seen by future generations. 
And I want people to see my clients in that same way. What, what were they known for? What was their legacy? What were they there on this earth to provide? That's my job is to, to, to bring that forward. That mission that I have is to show other people's legacy and their missions and their why for living. The most joyful part of writing for me can be divided into two sections. The first is just the creative process, being alone with words and creating something out of those words that brings beauty into the world or mystery or magic, makes people question. I love the process of writing. The second part is connecting with readers. When I go out and do a school visit or when I do a reading, a poetry reading, a fiction reading, and I can see a response from an audience and we can explore the meaning together, that's just a wonderful feeling. Painting for me has paid off in dividends that I never could have expected. Um, I would say the most satisfying part of being an artist is that painting Painting breaks down barriers, or at least speaking about, about paintings and the emotions behind it breaks down barriers. I find myself in conversations with complete strangers sometimes in front of a painting about some very real uh, human uh, things that I wouldn't uh, probably have ever talked to that person about. Um, I can, it puts me in the position sometimes to be almost like a therapist. And in the same vein, um, I'm, I'm asked uh, many times to do art for important events in people's lives or, um, or even death. So I, I get to interact with people in, in some very uh, real moments in their life. I'm always drawing and always creating, so um, a lot of times, uh, you know how kids are, they, they always want to draw and create too, so a lot of times around my, my friends' children or um, you know friends and family, so I'm always um, drawing with them and creating with them. And uh, I feel like uh, I've, I've had occasion to create little artists. And even um, I've had kids uh, who are you know now teenagers or young adults get a hold of me and say, Heidi, I never would have thought of being an artist, or right? I never would be doing this if it weren't for you. Yeah, I grew up playing sports, uh, baseball, football, basketball. Um, so I understand about what it is to be on a part of a team and that camaraderie and that feeling of, of um, you know, fellowship that way. We're part of a team. We're all getting something done. And with the theater and stage, it's, a, it's that same feeling only you feel it's a little more encompassing. You, you become a family, and you become not only physically involved in doing the play and, and, and going through all the motions, but you become, you're emotionally involved. You become, you have tender moments, and it knits you together with people. And um, I guess that's, that's what I was trying to get across, is, is it, you become a family every time you get together on stage and do a show. It gets me emotional talking about it because uh, you go come away with friendships that um, you feel like you always had. You feel like you really experienced something with people. And when you go through a show and it's successful and you're done, it is, uh, it's a great memory. It's a great moment. And it's something that you'll always have with you. Oh, the joy of music. I could talk for hours about it, but... Um... To narrow it down to a couple, I get a lot of joy out of knowing that people enjoy what I'm doing, and they might even let me know that they re were really touched by my music. That satisfies my itch like none other. The other joy is I taught long enough to have students fall in love with music and become teachers themselves. And there's nothing more joyful than to attend one of my former students' music concerts. I feel like a grandma. The most satisfying part of my art has to do with the effect that it has on people. Uh, it makes me extremely happy when I see people uh, 
slow down with my art and, and have emotions. I can see the internal gears going on in their mind uh, as a result of interacting with my art. That makes me super happy. So for different dancers and different choreographers, um, the thing that is the most satisfying is very, very unique to the individual. So I can only speak about what that is for me. And for me, the most satisfying thing has been connecting with people. Um, I enjoyed so much throughout my dance career and my dance training, and even now as a dance teacher and the administrator of dance programs, the idea that we can connect to each other through a, a language of dance, which is in fact a nonverbal language, and um, that we can share ideas and that we can collaborate to make new things out of a very old art form. Dance, ballet as we know it, is a, something that is 300 or more years old. And so today we get to take those old ideas and make them new again. We constantly get to reinvent the wheel, so to speak. Um, so this idea of, of innovation and the idea of connecting with each other as human beings one-on-one -on -one is really the thing that keeps me going as a dancer and as an artist. Mostly to develop INCLUDE as a program that reaches out to children and adults with special needs. Um, and this is a, a wide variety of special needs. And one of the parts of this program is to provide performances for these families. And what is so special to me is that after a performance of a sensory friendly performance, these families and these children come into the lobby and their, their voices are high with excitement, they're talking, they're laughing, they're joyful, and the parents come up to me and the children come up to me and they say, thank you so much. We rarely have the opportunity to, to go and go to the theater, much less go see dance, because, uh, because we, we, we can't sustain a show that long. We can't sit still that long. We can't be quiet that long. And the idea that we were able to connect with these families in such a personal way and make them excited about the art form and watch them walk away just still talking and laughing and being engaged in the arts is so heartwarming to, to me and, and to our whole staff. The most satisfying thing that I have in my art is when someone comes up to me and they say, I love the pieces on my wall. I love that, that image that is on my wall. I, had a, I have a, a mom that came up to me the other day uh, in this family of four. And she walked up to me and she said, you know, I vacuum my carpet in my living room on a regular basis. She says, I vacuum it almost daily. And she said, there's one thing that I love more than anything else is when I vacuum that carpet and I come back the next day and I see the footprints that go right into the living room, stop in front of the picture that you took of us, and then they stand there and she says, and then they turn around and they walk back out of the room. She says, I know whose footprints those are. Those are my husband's, who hardly ever sees the family. He's always gone, he's always working, he's always doing things. But the one thing he does do is he goes in and he looks at that image almost every day. And she said, she said with tears in her eyes, you know, that is the biggest gift you could ever give to the world, Rich. And I said, you know what? You're right. That is, that is the best gift I could ever give. the greatest challenge for many artists is self-doubt. When I was growing up, I loved books. They were my magic carpet to somewhere else. When things were difficult at home, I could read myself out of the situation. And I made friends through books. I loved the characters there. I thought people who wrote books were, had superpowers. But no one in my family had ever gone to college. I never met a writer. My school never had visiting writers. Becoming a writer seemed like an impossible dream, but it wasn't when I was ready to give up. To make a dream come true, you need to have people who believe in you. 
And that's what I found along the way. I kept that dream of being a writer, and I had teachers who encouraged me, and I had friends who said good things about my writing, and I began to get glimpses of the idea that it just might be possible. Um, as I got older, I tried my hand um, publishing a little on publishing poems, um, sending out a few short stories, and of course, most of those were rejected because rejection is part of the process. Self-doubt crept in, but I found and was able to surround myself with a group of friends who are also passionate about writing and passionate about the arts, and we encouraged each other. Finally, when my first poem was published, I got a handwritten note from the editor saying how much he loved it. When I read that note, I assumed right away that he was trying to encourage me because my poem wasn't as good as any of the others that he had received, but he didn't want to make me feel bad. Later, I realized how foolish that was and that that was just my own self-doubt talking. What he was really saying was just what he said. He liked the poem and he appreciated it. Self-doubt still creeps in. Every time I push send on my computer and I've finished a new piece of writing, I get nervous and I worry about it. But those people who believed in me are still there and are still my champions. In fact, tomorrow I'm going to be meeting a professor I haven't seen for 30 years who told me that one day I'd be a published poet. And he was right. The greatest challenge to being an artist, and especially a painter, is not to define myself. Um, when I enter a show, I'm usually asked to check a box. Which kind of painter are you? Are you a surrealist? Are you a portrait painter? Are you a plein air painter? Um, and I'm all of those things at different times. I, I hardly know what I am, I am going to be in going to be painting today and I certainly don't know what's going to inspire me tomorrow so I don't want to cut myself off from from those things or limit myself as a painter so I'd say I'd say that that's that's the most trying part is to not be pigeonholed the world likes to define you and wrap you up with a neat little bow so it can know what you are so resisting that is is very important to me for example, this is a painting I've done recently and entitled, I'm Not Dead Yet. And uh, some people might be put off by a painting like this, and I certainly didn't create it when I was uh, feeling great. Um, I, was, I was feeling depressed and down and a little beat up by the world, but, um, but still with that fighting spirit of I'm not dead yet and I'm not done yet and you haven't seen everything from me yet. So uh, this is an example of, of, of just allowing my feelings and, and what was going on at the time inspire my art and not trying to uh, pigeonhole it into a, into a box or, or even thinking about what might sell. And, and the neat thing about that is that um, I've had so many people react to this painting who have felt similar things that I, that I did when I, when I created it. I think probably the most challenging thing is to make yourself vulnerable. Uh, you, there are times where you, actually all the time, you, you need to make yourself, uh, any, every character has a vulnerability and that's what makes us human. And that's what makes the audience identify with you. If you're just a Superman and everything bounces off you and you don't have any emotion or anything like that, uh, there's no conflict, that's not an intriguing story. But if um, there's something wrong, there's, there's some battle that's being fought, uh, there's, there's some challenge, uh, you need to make sure that the audience can see that challenge in you. Um, I, think that, I think the vulnerability is the biggest thing. They need to know that you're a human factor, and that's what helps them identify with you. Challenges, they're all over the place. Um, sometimes the biggest challenge is inside of my head. You know, when you play music, you're going to make mistakes. I don't care how hard you practice, the mistakes are going to happen. And to get through those mistakes 
is where the challenge lies. And I think experience saves your bottom end quite a bit. Um, but that's one of the challenges I think of. Um, first world type problems is playing in a club where they won't turn off the TVs, you know, and you're trying to play music. And it's just like, how can anybody be that rude to music or to the artist that's there performing? That's a challenge for me. And a challenge would be to convince a kid that the music doesn't just flow down from heaven and all of a sudden you can play like Mozart. You have to put in the time and that becomes a challenge um, to convince kids that it really does take time and effort to become um, good at what you're doing as a musician. The most challenging part of uh, being a sculptor uh, has to do with uh, the, the heavy tools that I use and the space I need uh, to do my work. Um, you know, my paint and palette is uh, the, the welder and the angle grinder and the plasma cutter and air compressors, metal shears, all sorts of, even a forklift. And uh, it, takes, it takes time um, and quite a, bu quite a bit of investment to uh, acquire those tools. Um, unlike a lot of other studio artists, uh, where you can go to an art store to get your materials and supplies, uh, I go to industrial environments, I go to scrap yards, I go to metal yards. Um, not only that, but I need, I need uh, space to do that. And so for, for many years I've worked outside uh, in the rain and the snow and the wind and zero degrees temperature and 120 degrees. So it's been, uh, it's been an extreme um, challenge in pursuing this, uh, this career. The other thing uh, that creates a challenge is, is the unique skills that you need. Um, of course, you know, learning how to weld is, uh, is a skill that takes time, but also um, things that only experience can teach you, such as warpage and loads and finesse, not to mention artistic composition. And so it just takes time and devotion in order to uh, develop those um, kinds of things in order to do this. So one of the biggest challenges for me personally has always been trust. And this is the idea of trusting myself um, and trusting myself not only as a dancer, but continuing on as a teacher and even as, as an administrator. And um, a, a story that I think really illustrates this in my personal life is at a time when I was mid-career, as a, perform, as a professional performing dancer. And in this particular year, I auditioned for 17 individual dance companies and I traveled to five different cities. I had to fly to each of them. It was quite expensive and it was exhausting. And they all said no. All 17 companies said no, thank you very much. We do not have a job for you. Um, until about four months after that, I uh, got a, a Facebook message and this Facebook message invited me to come to Chicago and join a company called Luna Negra Dance Theater. And I was thrilled. I sold all my stuff and I put the rest of it in storage and I packed two suitcases and one backpack and I moved to Chicago with nothing and I didn't know anyone. And all was well and good the first week until it hit me that I was in this new place in new surroundings and this big job, it was the my dream job, the, the job I always wanted, and I was terrified. And I lost all trust in myself, and I spent that entire first year of that job searching and hoping that I could regain that trust in myself to work as a dancer, to work as an artist, uh, to be in the room with all these amazing people. I uh, took a step back, and I looked around and I realized that my, my work with the company was actually beginning to suffer. It was no longer something that was just in my mind, a fear that I had created just in my mind. It was something that was beginning to be reflected in my, in my work and in my ability to enjoy my job, which is the thing that I always wanted to do dance in a professional dance company. Um, and that was, that was really a moment where I realized I needed, needed to take action uh, and, and action quickly to help myself regain this trust and to be able to refine, uh, to be able to find my love again for dance. And, and I took a lot of different steps to figure out what that was. I spoke to the director and I was very honest with the director and I told him how I was feeling and, and he was very accepting of that. And that was, that was a big, 
big leap to trust him, to to honor my fear. The ability to reach out to other people is really the thing that helped me overcome my, my fear and, and regain my, the trust in myself. And that's something that I continue to do today. The greatest challenge to being an artist, I think in this day and age, we're in the age of the iPhone. We're in the age of digital, and which has been a great media. Um, it, it has been really, really helpful to have digital help us all, but we've fallen off this cliff and people can do with an iPhone what it used to take months, weeks, years to provide, to pr produce. And that's been really tough because then it devalues what artists do. If we're not careful, if we don't start revaluing art as what it is and really revaluing what the art forms are that are out there, whether they be music, photography, painting, whatever they are, if you don't start revaluing those things, they're gonna be lost. My advice to all writers is to respect the craft. And what I mean by that is don't believe, don't buy into the overnight success stories that you often hear. Those stories capture us because they're so rare. Very few, almost no, writers become successful overnight, just like very few athletes, musicians, or anyone else in the arts do. And you've probably heard this all before, but it means that you have to make a commitment to something Jane Yolen calls BIC, and that means butt in chair. So this is what it looks like. In the morning, I'm at my computer on writing days by 8 a.m. And I look at my email. And then I listen to some music on Pandora. And then I um, play a game of Scrabble, or I think of some other way to get out of doing the work that I need to do. But eventually, before I'll let myself get up, I sit down, I write, I put in my 500 or my 1,000 words every day, even when I don't feel inspired, which is most of the time. The other side of that, of respecting the craft, is knowing that the craft involves rejection. And that's a hard one. It took me a long time to realize that rejecting my writing wasn't rejecting me. A friend of mine several years ago got the idea that we should collect 100 rejections a year. So a group of us decided to do that. Our goal was not acceptances, our goal was rejections, because that meant at least we were doing work and we were sending it out into the world. They could be rejections on magazine articles or poems, short stories, but we were each going to try and collect our 100. And we did, but along with that 100, I also started getting some acceptances. That was the other side. And I think it happened because to get rejections, you put in the work, you respect the craft, and you do it to the best of your ability. And through all of those, I was getting better. Besides, respecting the craft and taking your rejections keeps you humble. Another very important thing a very important piece of advice for any artist. The recommendation I would have for aspiring artists is to, to just do you. Paint, draw, uh, act, write your own experience. Uh, no one has that unique vision that is you except for you. And, and a lot of times, um, myself included, I th I've been guilty of, of thinking of what would sell or how I could be most successful, but I've continually had the most success when I don't think that way at all and I just try to, to illustrate my own unique experience. That, that honesty and that realness is what the world responds to. For example, I had um, 
uh, someone that I knew uh, and had around my home steal from me, and um, and I was very angry at this person, and and I and I yelled at this person. That was the last interaction that I had with them. But when I went away from it, uh, it bothered me, and I, and I and their face just kept coming back into my mind. And it, eventually, the way that I worked through it was I painted a portrait of this person, and it turned into one of the one of the best paintings I've ever done. Um, and, and through that experience of painting that person, I um, well, let go of the anger and I saw them on a, on a really human level. Um, so very, it was very therapeutic for me. Um, and also, you know, it lent to a good work of art. Okay, recommendations for aspiring actors. Number one, and probably the best one I can give you, do not quit. You'll have every opportunity to quit. Go try out for a show. Go get involved in a theater. Um, are you going to get your first part? Probably not. Are you going to get the second part you auditioned for? Probably not. Are you going to get the third? Probably not. Don't ever quit. The more you are put yourself out there, and that's remember that's the tough thing that I said, putting yourself out there. The more you put yourself out there, the better you'll get, the more confidence you'll get, and you'll start getting the parts. When you start realizing those are the parts that you're supposed to be getting. A lot of times we try out for these parts that we think, oh, I'd be great at that, but really you just don't fit the part. You're gonna meander around, find a lot of different directions, but you'll find that spot and that, um, and success breeds more success. You'll get better and better, but don't give up. Just keep going. One other thing I wanted to mention as a recommendation is to trust in yourself. It's a, it's a learning curve, and you just got to trust that you will get there. And even if you have to tell yourself in the mirror every day or every time you're going before an audition or... Uh, or getting together with other actors, um, trust in yourself, because you can do it. You will get there. If I could do anything to help you become all you want to be as a musician, the first thing I would say is you have to practice. Practice. And practice. You never stop. You never arrive. So get that in your head. And then listen. Listen to the people that have gone before us on their instrument and appreciate what they've done and what the ways they've paved for us. It's really important that you look for inspiration um, to help fulfill your musical inspiration. For me, a lot of times it's just sitting outside and listening to nature all around me or, or watching a beautiful sunrise or sunset. Inspiration comes from all different places, so soak it up and then try to put it into what it is you're doing with your music. Never give up. Find time every day to experience, to explore your musical craft. It will be worth it and you will grow. Spend as much time on your musical stuff as you do your games and everything will be just fine. I have uh, min much advice for the aspiring artists. Um, starting with devotion to your craft. You need to spend time um, thinking about art, creating art, practicing art, um, just working on art, spending hours and hours a day uh, for every day working on your craft. The other thing uh, is immersion. Now, not to be confused with devotion, immersion by that I mean immersion in the art world, and that is going to art galleries, going to art museums, talking with other artists, reading books on art, studying artists that you like. Uh, the other thing is sleep. Uh, our society uh, underrates the ne necessity of sleep. Uh, we, we reward people who uh, selflessly devote and hurt themselves uh, in order to attain their goals. But uh, sleep is a critical thing to clean the brain uh, of toxins. It also allows our minds um, time to live in the subconscious and unconscious worlds. And it's in those worlds where we derive creative inspiration. Uh, balance. Um, 
Now, uh, contrary to just uh, devoting all your time to it, you also have to spend time um, sharpening the saw. There's a book out there called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and in it the author talks about production versus production capability. And what that means is, say we have a machine, maybe we are the machine, and you can work that machine 24 hours a day, every day of the week, and without any downtime, without any maintenance. And for a brief period of time, you're going to get an increase in productivity. But ultimately, in the long run, you, it's, gonna, it's gonna get hurt and broken, and you're gonna have to maintain that machine, you're gonna have to repair that machine. And so it's critical to take time to, uh, to slow down and to meditate and to rest and to find your inspiration in addition to work. The other advice I have is about being authentic. Doing art that uh, makes you want to dance, that makes you happy, that makes you ecstatic. Doing art that speaks your truth, not what other people want you to do, but art that is what you want to do. That's being authentic. The other suggestion I have is about writing. Uh, there's a great book out there called The Artist's Way, and in it, she talks about uh, something called morning pages, where the first thing in the morning, you write three pages of anything and everything that comes into your mind. And what this does is it gets all the thoughts that are bouncing around in our, in our minds throughout the day, it gets them out of our mind and onto paper. In a sense, it's kind of like we go through our day with too many applications up in a computer, and it's just bogging down our computer. And by writing, it has the effect of turning those applications off and allowing our minds to process things better. That leads me to um, limiting technology. Uh, technology uh, distracts us. It uh, dilutes our focus. It has been shown that the mere presence of a smartphone turned off will reduce our test scores significantly, as well as uh, our emotional intelligence. And so I have a few suggestions on how to limit technology. One thing is, of course, remove all social applications from your, uh, from your uh, smartphone. Uh, turn all your screens into grayscale to make it less attractive. Log out of websites when you're done with them. Turn off your computer before you leave. Uh, don't reach for your phone first thing in the morning. Turn off your phone at night so you can get good sleep. These are some things that you can do to limit the uh, focus-sucking technology in our life. That then leads me to my final suggestion, and that is about nature. Nature is our source, it's where we come from, it's we, where we derive sustenance. Nature recharges our batteries, and it has been shown that even people who are in the most stressed out states of their life, when they are outside in beautiful, pristine nature, they find inspiration, they find happiness and their batteries are recharged. It's absolutely critical to be in nature every day, preferably, for, for your creative uh, pursuits. Try everything and to learn about as many things as they can and to be as open-minded as absolutely possible. Um, about four years ago, I was working with a group of high school students in Camas, Washington, and they were a part of a newly developed arts program at their high school. And these were artists of all kinds. Some of them were visual, some of them were musical, uh, some of them were theater artists, and some of them were, were also dancers. And during my work with them, which was about 12 weeks, we, we really actually butted heads, and there was a lot of tension between myself as a professional working artist and them as high school students. And at, at one point, I, we just had to sit down and have a heart to heart and, and realize that our goals were all the same, that, that m m my sharing dance with them was not so that they could be dancers, but it's so that they have the opportunity to experience dance as maybe something that they can then 
put into their photography or create uh, their experience through visual representation. And the, the work that they were able to produce in their student showcase at the end of the year after that was really exciting. And some of the kids came up to me at, the, at their showcase and they said, thank you so much for, for being honest and real and authentic with us and, and helping us slow down and realize that we can experience something without having to own it for the rest of our lives. And uh, that, that's my, my recommendation to all my students. Do as many things as you can do and, and have an open mind. Recommendations I have for aspiring artists. Well, I think the number one recommendation I can make, live unapologetically. Live with your greatest passion in mind. It's so important. There's my passion coming through. Live with everything you've got and push as hard as you can. And don't apologize for your art. If somebody doesn't like them, like your art, it's their problem, not yours. Do everything you can to become as good as you can at this art. Study everything you can. If you love it, study it. Be passionate about it. Push as hard as you can. Work so hard that eventually you'll have mastered the art and it won't matter whether people like it or not because it will be so good they won't have a choice. They'll be drawn to it like flies, like moths to a light. They won't have a choice. And they're gonna go, wow, some of our greatest artists aren't appreciated for the art that they made when they were alive. They're appreciated for it now. Leonardo da Vinci wasn't appreciated while he was alive. But now, he's one of the greatest artists that ever lived. You could be the next Leonardo da Vinci, but you got to live with passion and you have to study and study hard and work hard and do everything you can to be an artist. Dancer Renee Adams has been a professional dancer, dance educator, and arts administrator for 15 years. Recently, her work has focused on implementing programs that bring dance experiences into community centers and K-12 classrooms. Photographer Richard Brashears began his career as an enthusiastic and skillful amateur. Soon, his talent and passion transformed his burgeoning hobby into a booming profession. With 20 years of award-winning images to his credit, Richard is a master of photography and a certified professional photographer. Painter Heidi Elkington hails from the Pacific Northwest and enjoys using paint to explore what it means to be human. Her work is often characterized by the liberal use of color and the themes of life and death. Musician Debbie Ng started her musical journey with piano lessons at age five. In 1994, she became a high school music educator. Add to that a host of professional gigs dating back to 1979 and continuing to this day. Author Maureen McQuarrie is a novelist, poet, and teacher. She taught middle school, high school, and college for 20 years and is a frequent presenter at schools and literary conferences. She has published three novels for young adults and her poetry can be found in many literary journals. Sculptor Joseph Rastovich has been creating large steel sculptures since he was 14 years old. He has completed 13 public sculptures and participates in many of the top art festivals in the Western United States. As a bonus, he is also 
a musician, dancer, and writer who strives to create space for others to express themselves. Actor Michael Thomas is an established stage actor with many leading roles to his credit, including Of Mice and Men, The 39 Steps, Same Time Next Year, and Frost Nixon. He also provides voiceover and acting services for both film projects and commercial industries. Alan Johnson, that would be me, is a full-time psychologist and a part-time author, actor, musician, painter, and photographer and videographer. That's all, folks.